just didn't know what to do, but we managed to pivot a little bit at, during that and took a lot of our auction and, and fundraisers online, and uh, it, it, it worked. We, we really appreciated support last year online, but um, the world has changed a little bit since we last saw each other, but um, it's just wonderful to gather together in, in this place. So, um, so welcome every single one of you that have come from near and far, and we're so excited to, with this wonderful lineup of speakers today, that are going to share information about the, a lot of information about Sheridan, Kansas, and what an interesting place that was. Uh, so uh, would just uh, let us know if there's anything you need, um, and if there's any way we can help you and, and keep you comfortable. And uh, also just during the day, I'm going to, we're going to be reminding you, we do have our online, our online auction items are on display in the Wiser Room, as well as our live auction items for tonight. And uh, the, the, there's an online site that you can go to, auction32.com, FT Wallace Museum. And if you want to bid any time during the day on the items that you see, just feel free. Uh, let's, I might even see if I can scare up a QR code that might be easy to scan and go to that site. I'll put old Tony on that here in a little bit. But um, Tony. Tony. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, thank you to uh, so many people that helped today, including uh, the Buffalo Bill Cultural Center, which sent us with all these bags. We realized at the last minute that we needed bags for all this stuff that we gave you today. So they provided those. All of our sponsors uh, today, we're really uh, pleased. Our, our two, two named sponsors are uh, Rocky Mountain Natural Meats in Fort Lupton, Colorado, who provided all of the buffalo meat for tonight. 64 pounds, so we really thank them very much. And then also to Stacy Hamey, is he here today? Stacy Hamey uh, from Scott City was also a very generous sponsor for our event, so we really appreciate that. And you'll see other people and other sponsors, including donors for the auction items that are named in there. Also to our uh, hardworking board, do we have board members here today. Board members, could you please stand? Fort Wallace Memorial Association. Ron. Ron. Woo! So our Fort Wallace Memorial Association board, that is the Fort Wallace Memorial Association owns and operates this museum. It's an independent 501c3. We do get Oh, what is it, Lynn? About twelve thousand dollars from the from the county, but otherwise we're completely we're completely supported by by all our friends, and uh, so that the guardians of the Fort Wallace Museum are, was uh, put together to uh, to be the fundraising arm for this organization. The Fort Wallace Memorial Association is coming up on a hundred years old. Yay! Isn't that, isn't that really cool? A hundred year old five, uh, uh, independent organization. And so the Guardians was just set up three years ago to help uh, with the extra support of the programming. It's for programming, for promotion, and for the operation of the museum. That's to pay our staff, to pay our lights, everything that needs to be done. So we really appreciate any support, all, all support that uh, can be given during this day and then others. Um, so... Anything else? Okay, well, without further ado, um, I would like to recognize uh, Deb Goodrich, who is our Garvey, Texas historian. She is supported through the Garvey, Texas Foundation, and she does widespread work uh, all over the U.S. To helping to spread the word about the Fort Wallace Memorial Association. We're blessed to have her as a uh, uh, her, her black book is incredible. Who she can, she says, I may not know everything, but I know somebody that does. And that's the truth. So uh, a lot of these contacts, these speakers are coming through Deb Goodrich. And we also just like having her around because she's fun. Thank you. So, uh, Deb, tell us what you, what you know here. All righty. Should okay. I get my stool? Get your stool. They were worried that I couldn't see over the podium. <laughs> so now if I can just keep from woohoo. <laughs> All right. This is so cool. 
I may just stay here all day. You may have a hard time getting me away now. Well, what Jane said about my little black book, I have been very blessed. And we were talking about it last night. The, the first number in my little black book is D.K. Clark. And it's like, after I met D.K., I thought, why did I even bother to go to college? You know, it's like, I could have just called D.K. You know, phone a friend, I could have just called D.K. And he had everything at his fingertips. So um, we're, we're really blessed by D.K.'s presence here today, too. And, and so many friends that... Um, I've been so generous, but DK has meant a lot through my life. And like I said, every time I didn't know something, DK did. So I, I appreciate you, buddy. Um, somehow, I wound up as chair of the 200th anniversary of the Santa Fe Trail. And I've been seriously blessed by my time in Kansas. When I was living in the eastern part of the state, I got to be a part of the 150th anniversaries of the Kansas Territory, and then of the Civil War, the 150th of the founding of Topeka, just so many of those anniversaries that I got to be a part of in the eastern part of the state. And then I come to the western part of the state, and it's the 150th that we've celebrated here, you know, of the Forsyth Scouts, of the Battle at Wallace, of, you know, all those events in 67, 68, 69. And it's been tremendous to be, a, be able to be a part of each one of those. And to be part of the 200th of the Santa Fe Trail has been a real eye-opener to me. And like the Fort Wallace Memorial Association, the Santa Fe Trail Association is full of dedicated people that for decades now have been working toward preserving not only the story of the trail, but the trail itself in places. So thanks to their efforts, you can, in many places throughout the, um, the, the route of the trail, you can see the actual ruts that, that people um, drove their wagons over so many years ago. And it's, it's a, just an incredible piece of American history. So I've been very blessed to be part of that organization and part of this um, historic anniversary. So we had invited uh, Joanne Van Covern today, who is the manager of the Santa Fe Trail Association and knows more than anybody, I believe. She's just an amazing, uh, generous person and so knowledgeable. She, unfortunately, has COVID. And so I would ask you to keep Joanne in your prayers. She's uh, not been hospitalized, but she's really struggled. She's had a really rough time. So we're really sorry that she couldn't be with us today. But we are very fortunate to have Chris Day, who is the vice president and future president of the Santa Fe Trail Association, and is one of those tireless people. I'm just, I, I can't believe what Chris gets done and her focus and her um, dedication. So she has been devoted to education along the trail and has participated and some wonderful programs that I would like to see us emulate in some ways here at, at Fort Wallace. So we're so thrilled that um, Chris could be with us today and by no means Team B, she's part of the A team. And Chris, we'd love to have you come up and, and share with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, now that Deb has pumped me up so much, I'm going to have to work pretty hard here today. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am a charter member of the Santa Fe Trail Association. Um, at the age of uh, 31, I became a charter member. Um, I'm also a member of the Smoky Hill Trail Association. Being a charter member then and being part of that association now, I, I still think I'm one of the youngest ones. So... Um, you know, we're always striving to have uh, younger blood come into our association. Uh, I taught, uh, I'm, a, I'm an amateur historian and a professional musician, and I taught music for 42 years um, in a K through uh, college situation. So uh, in retirement, I'm, I'm really enjoying the fact that I can, I can do more for the Santa Fe Trail Association, and, and so I... I stepped up into the SFTA vice president. Um, 
I'm going to give you an, over, an, an overview today of the Santa Fe Trail, and I'm going to segue, if I have time, into um, our Junior Wagon Master Program. Um, it is an activity book developed for pre-K children through adults. And uh, we're very proud of this program, and it's, it's, it's been up and running very well for uh, several years right now. So um, I'll, I'll move into that because that if you're more interested in, in taking the trail, um, these activity books um, are a part of that. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and get started of our 200th anniversary. See light. Are you turned on? <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, it is on. Try it again. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, as you can see on my map by 1794, Spain controlled much of the Americas, and um, the colonists really lived under a tight control of uh, Spanish authorities. Uh, trade that did not benefit the mother country, even trading with the Indian tribes, was not allowed, just simply not allowed. The colonists received uh, much needed goods from Spain only once every two years, every three years, depending. Um, they have to make their way from Spain, um, one of the ports of Spain, um, probably to Veracruz, uh, would be like over 6,000 nautical miles. Um, once they got to Veracruz, they had to put the supplies on pack trains, and then once into Mexico City and Chihuahua, uh, they had to take the supplies and put them on uh, pack animals due to the mountainous regions getting into Santa Fe. So it would be like us once every three years going to our favorite um, store in our town to get supplies. So um, that was the kind of situation um, the people were in um, during the Spanish territory. Uh, move on here. When Thomas Jefferson purchased uh, Louisiana Territory from France, he purchased it for $15 million. And at that point, of course, it doubled um, the size of the United States. Almost immediately following uh, that purchase, we then had the pioneers from, you know, the Virginias, um, Tennessee, and Kentucky, uh, along with their slaves. They followed Daniel Boone into an area where the Mississippi River met the Mississippi River. Although Spain still controlled much of the Southwest, rumors of gold and silver um, near the Santa Fe area spread throughout the land. So um, in 1806, Jefferson sent Lieutenant Zebulon Pike to explore the area south and west of the Louisiana Purchase. And Pike had to contact um, Native Americans along the way, the tribes, to inform them that um, their territory was now um, claimed by the U.S. Um, the expedition uh, w that Pike was leading was captured by the Spanish and taken into Mexico. Pike and some of his men were eventually released, um, while others were held captives for years. Um, when Pike returned back to the United States, um, he told stories of the high prices that the New Mexicans were willing to pay um, for cloth and also for hardware items. So bringing that idea back to the United States, um, you know, created a situation where um, the possibilities of trading down there eventually. Um, the money to purchase the Louisiana Territory, of course, was borrowed from the Bank of the United States, and the new settlers in Missouri also borrowed heavily for banks to purchase their land. Eventually, you know, the boom gave out, and the banks demanded the loans to be paid back 
only in gold or silver. And they considered paper money was very useless at that time. So if you couldn't pay back your debts at that time, then the only alternative, um, unfortunately, was jail. Okay, so here we have the advance. Um, Missouri became the first state west of the Mississippi. It was a slave state which upset the balance in the U.S. Senate. The Missouri Compromise allowed Maine to enter as a free state, securing the balance. Mexico won its in, uh, freedom from Spain, its fight for freedom from Spain, and then William Becknell makes the first successful training trip to Santa Fe. Now, William Becknell um, was an Indian fighter. Um, he was a veteran of the War of 1812, and he was one of those uh, gentlemen facing jail because he was bankrupt. He had heavily invested in the new town of Franklin, Missouri, um, purchasing lots for buildings. Um, he started his own ferry service. He also invested money into the nearby salt licks. Rather than to go to jail, he decides to take a gamble. Now before, um, during the independence uh, strife uh, in 1821, um, Mark Simmons pretty much believes that in his research that Rumors had already, come, had already come up to the United States that Mexico had won its independence from Spain. So whether or not, you know, William Becknell knew that, um, we're not sure. But anyway, he was ready to take the gamble. And he advertised in the um, Franklin, Missouri paper, the Missouri Intelligencer. This is just a replica of what that paper was at that time. And... He wanted um, men to join him in rounding up horses on the plains. However, the truth was, he was headed to Santa Fe to get rich quick. That was his, really his whole plan. He and um, Sir, uh, Mark Simmons says there were several men that went with him. A lot of your books will say five, but he believes there were several men that went with him. Um, and they had trade goods uh, packed on horses. Um, they went along um, what we would call the mountain route of the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, they crossed the mountains um, going down to Santa Fe. And um, on their way down there, they did meet um, Mexican um, troops and thought for sure at this point in time that they were going to be hauled in and be jailed. Um, actually, they were welcomed by the Mexican troops. They, they escorted them into Santa Fe. And uh, Becknell set up a store on the plaza and sold his goods. On his return trip, um, not all the men went, came back with him. Um, but there was a report that there were four to five men that actually came back with him. Um, he brought back the Spanish coins and silver. Um, he was pretty encouraged on on his way back, um, you know, he's already thinking ahead. Okay, I made some money on this first trip. The possibility of bringing down more goods and hardware to sell, you know, I'm going to need some wagons. So taking that treacherous trip over the mountains, he realizes that he's going to have to venture out and find a, an easier route. And so on his way back, he, he is scouting for a better route. So in May of 1822, he and 30 men... With three thousand to five thousand dollars in goods, they left Missouri, and of course he had packed it all in three wagons. Had, and the route he found um, after leaving, he went. You know, he left the wooded areas of Missouri, um, entered the tall grass prairie into the short grass, and he crossed the Arkansas River, which at that point was the boundary of the United States with Mexico. So you know, he's already beginning that first. Uh, incident of international trade. They headed south, uh, reaching the Cimarron Desert. There is a dry parchment of land from the Arkansas River down to um, where you can meet the Cimarron River. Um, it's just, there's just no water. And so, you know, 60 miles is a long way to go um, with no water. So, you know, in time, people were putting barrels on their wagons and filling it with water. Um, but uh, that went so far, basically had to go to the animals. Um, so there's just a lot of stories out there about um, 
bad area for traveling and the deaths and the starvation of thirst. And so anyway, they went that area. They had a rough time going down. And at, after 40 days uh, on the trail, the caravan reached back into Santa Fe. Um, the men sold their wares, uh, including their wagons. Um, they returned with a profit uh, to Missouri, they returned with a profit of $91,000 in silver and gold, along with numerous mules. Becknell had escaped the jail sentence, and he paid off his debts and uh, later on moved in, down into Texas. Many traders uh, began going to Santa Fe selling goods and bringing back silver and gold coins. This enabled Missouri to thrive when financial depression struck the rest of the country. The Mexican eight reales silver coins, pieces of eight, became legal tender in the United States it's down here, um, until 1857. And it was um, milled into eight pieces and each bit was worth, um, was one eighth of the dollar, and each bit was worth uh, 12.5 cents. So if haircuts were two bits, then, you know, that was a quarter. That was a quarter. Soon manufactured items from the eastern coast of the United States and Europe made up a bulk of the goods traveling to Mexico. Furs and wool fleeces and woven goods Silver mules um, traveled from Mexico for trade in the United States. Over the years, millions of dollars in merchandise traveled this 900-mile international trade route. One famous entrepreneur, there were many, was James All, who made annual winter trips to wholesales on the East Coast to purchase goods for his stores when often spending up to $45,000. A typical buying trip for him would be leaving his town of Lexington, Missouri in January, going on horseback to St. Louis, where stagecoaches to Louis, Louis, Louisville, Philadelphia, and New York. The goods would then be shipped by steamers to New Orleans, paddled up the Mississippi River to Missouri, and eventually freight wagons to Santa Fe. The entrepreneurs owned stores not only in Santa Fe, but also in new towns springing up along the trail. Most of the items weren't made in Missouri, but came from the East Coast states, Europe, and even Asia. This is pictures from um, the steamboat Arabia in Kansas City. Um, that steamboat sank in 1856, and there were 200 tons of uh, historic objects um, on that steamboat. Um, it's now a museum. Uh, the Hawley family uh, discovered this steamboat. Um, they uncovered it uh, from a field a half mile from the Missouri River, uh, the present channel, and this was in 1988. So if you ever get a chance to go to Kansas City and see the Steamboat Arabia um, Museum, it, it's just the most wonderful collection of what goods and materials were available in the 1850s. This is just another example of, of the hardware and the weapons. They said that it would take probably 20 years to uh, clean up all the items and put them on display. And so over the years, we've gone over there uh, several times to see, and more and more of the collection keeps coming, and they're still not done. So um, it's just a wonderful opportunity to see that. By 1820s, the settlers were living along both banks of the Missouri River as far west as St. Louis, from west of St. Louis to Old Franklin. In the beginning of the Santa Fe Trail, by 1830, there were several steamboat landings all along the river to Westport, Kansas City. Steamboat landings were essential for getting the goods from eastern United States, Europe, and even Asia unloaded and loaded again in wagons heading for Santa Fe. Beginning in 1826, prominent, or, or, um, sorry, prominent rich families of New Mexico, such as the Chavez, 
also entered into the commerce along the trail. By 1843, traders from New Mexico and Chihuahua had become the majority of traders involved in the traffic of goods over the Santa Fe Trail. These Mexican families would travel the trail to Missouri, then onto the East Coast to purchase items coming from Europe and to take their children to the East to attend boarding schools. And we have examples there of the Mexican merchandise. You can see the, the, the peppers, the pottery, the silver, and the turquoise. We have the beaded works, uh, the serapes, uh, the, the blankets, and then there, that's an ocarina down there. After Beck, Becknell brought mules back from Santa Fe, the mules replaced the horse as a preferred draft animal on the Santa Fe Trail. The mule had several, several advantages over the horse. The mule was not so susceptible to diseases as the horse. It required about half the amount of grain to supplement grazing as the horse, and it was less prone to harness sores than the horse. And they were um, cheaper to buy than a horse uh, at that point in time. Uh, later on, um, when Bennett um, Riley um, took the wagons out uh, on escorts, he would be the first to using oxen, um, pulling the wagons. Brigadier General Stephen Kearney is one of the best known frontier officers of the U.S. Army. In 1846, at the beginning of the Mexican-American War, he took a force of 2,500 2, men along the Santa Fe Trail to Santa Fe. By the time they arrived in Santa Fe, the Mexican military forces in New Mexico had retreated uh, to Mexico without fighting, and Kearney's forces easily took control of New Mexico, declaring Santa Fe as part of the United States. He's especially remembered for the conquest out into California. Susan McGoffin was 18 years old and on her honeymoon and married to one of the Santa Fe Trail traders. They, they traveled the trail following the Army of the West to Santa Fe. She certainly traveled in style. Their outfit included 14 big wagons with six yoke of oxen each, one baggage wagon with two yoke, one Dearborn with two mules, her own carriage with two mules, and two men on mules driving the loose stock. They also brought along a maid, a cook, and a coop of live chickens. Susan thought she was, although she wasn't at that time, the first American lady to have made this trip, but she was not. Susan's carriage had an accident when crossing Ash Creek uh, in Kansas. By the time they arrived at Ben's Fort, she suffered a miscarriage. While the McGoffin spent the time at the fort, Susan kept a detailed diary about the fort and its structures which along with another army engineer that was um, ill, had taken ill at the fort, um, the National Park Service heavily relied on these diaries and these drawings to do their reproduction later on of Bent's Fort. Her book, Down the Santa Fe Trail and Into New Mexico, um, is about her travels, has become one of the most popular firsthand primary source about the Santa Fe Trail. And she died. Um, very young, she had contacted yellow fever down in Chihuahua area, had another miscarriage, um, happened to have one child, and the granddaughter of, of uh, Susan McGoffin found her diary up in the attic of the house. And that's how all this came about for this book. It is important to understand that the land through which the Santa Fe Trail ran has been the home of many Indian tribes long before U Europeans first began their colonization. Many things that happened during the era of the Santa Fe Trail contributed to the mistreatment of the Indians. All right, our forts along the Santa Fe Trail. Um, Fort Osage is in uh, Jackson County, Missouri. It was... Um, 
an outpost um, when the newly acquired um, Louisiana Purchase um, happened. Um, it housed soldiers. Um, it was that factory trade house. Later on, it became a stop for travelers on the trail. Uh, Fort Leavenworth, um, established in 1827, were the first military escorts for wagons to Santa Fe. A lot of military trails down from Fort Leavenworth to the Santa Fe Trail. And then, talking earlier, this is Bent's Fort. Um, the Adobe Trading Post was established in the 1840s. It was by William Bent and his brothers and Saran St. Vrain. They, it was known to the others as um, Fort William, but uh, William Bent uh, was sort of the manager of the fort. And it was, um, it was a trader's fort, brought in um, Indian trade. William Bent was married to um, uh, Cheyenne women. Um, his first wife died, and then he married her sister. And so extensive trade there. Um, the Army of the West came through um, uh, Bent's Fort and stayed there for quite a long time before moving down the trail into Santa Fe. All right, Fort Union um, was built after the U.S.-Mexican War, another defense area, um, very important supply fort uh, during the uh, conflict of the Civil War. And then Fort Larned was established to protect the Santa Fe Trail during the Indian Wars. Um, this uh, Fort Larned, if you've not been there, it has the most uh, unique um, buildings um, that survived all these years of the, of the trail. Okay, just some questions. How many years did mer merchandise go up and down the Santa Fe Trail? If there were three wagon trains a week all, all year long, how many wagon trains went down the trail in one year? If there were 200 wagons on each of those wagon trains, how many wagons traveled the trail in one year? So that's just some, some things we put together about um, knowing the number of years and what merchandise uh, was going and how many wagons were going. So 58 years um, with the three wagons a week, 156 trains, and then of course with the 200 wagons, um, you're 31,200 trains per year. So there are diary counts of people discounting the, the, the wagon trains going by. The Santa Fe Trail nearly 900 miles in length, was profitable international trail that would last for six decades. During that time, the trail became shorter and shorter. This was due to the building of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. As the railroad advanced to southwest, the jumping off point of the Santa Fe Trail also moved with it. Trade goods were carried on the train, and the Santa Fe traders picked them up at the furthest roundhouse, then headed on to Santa Fe. By 1879, the railroad had made it to Lamy, very, uh, very close to Santa Fe, marking the end of the 835-mile mount, mountain route of the Santa Fe Trail from Kansas City. On February 9, 1880, the first Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe train actually entered Santa Fe after 18-mile spur of the track funded by a special bond election was built. Maybe some of you have noticed uh, the DA markers that uh, mark our trail. Um, the Daughters of American Revolution um, started this project in 1902, um, and their efforts um, saved the marking of the trail. It may have been lost forever if um, something like this would have, um, not have happened. Um, in 1906, they started placing the 86 markers. And then after that, um, the DARs in Missouri and Colorado and New Mexico followed um, putting up the granite stones. As you can see, it's still granite, but some of them are different colors. One hundred years after uh, putting up these mar the DAR markers, um, Honorary State Regent Shirley Koppel chose as her project to survey all the DA markers on the Santa Fe Trail in Kansas and make whatever repairs were necessary to allow them to proudly stand for another century. 
The Kansas Society funded the restoration of the Santa Fe Trail markers with work completing in 2010. And of course, some of those markers had been moved and they had to be moved back to the original place. So it was quite a project. Uh, the DAR Madonna of the Trail in Council Grove, um, in 1909, Missouri DAR women also wanted to mark the Santa Fe Trail. The women turned to Missouri and Harry Truman, head of the National Old Trails Association, and the idea grew to, to a tribute to the brave women who left their homes with their families and crossed the U.S. in covered wagons to make a new home. As president, Truman was able to oversee funding for the project. In the 1920s, the design was commissioned. There are 12 Madonnas. The first one is in Maryland, and the last one is in California. Kansas has the Madonna located in Council Grove, honoring the Santa Fe Trail. And what would be closer to you out here would be in Lamar. There is the, the Madonna of the Trail in Lamar. All right, so 34 years ago, on May 8, 1987, the 40th President, Ronald Reagan, signed the bill to make the trail the official Santa Fe National Historic Trail. And it's just interesting that um, in 1940, Ronald Reagan was in a movie called Santa Fe Trail. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he was featured as uh, George Armstrong Custer, and then 47 years later, he is signing the legislation to make this a National Historic Trail. So I thought that was pretty ironic. All right, featured here uh, is a picture of Mark Simmons. And Mark Simmons is, has specialized his whole life, the history of New Mexico, um, Native Americans, Spanish and Mexican, um, Colonial Times, Santa Fe Trail, and more toward the end of the time he was writing, um, he was uh, depth research into Kit Carson. And the founding of the Santa Fe Trail Association, um, Mark Simmons is one of those that, uh, along with, there's several other people, but um, he is one of those that helped push to make it um, an association. And our first symposium was in 1986, and it was in Trinidad. And at that point, he was the keynote speaker, and he opened up the keynote speaking of the Santa Fe Trail lives on. And that's been carried on through several symposiums. When people get up to speak, they quote Mark Simmons, um, the Santa Fe Trail lives on. So I'm not going to check my time, make sure I don't go over. All right, so without the PowerPoint, I'm going to move into um, the, I don't think you hear me. I'll speak loudly. <laughs> yeah, can I just hold it? Thank you. All right, um, in, in um, 1990, no, 2007, get my facts right. In 2007, um, Superintendent of the National Park Service, John Conavoy, approached the uh, Education Committee of the Santa Fe Trail Association, and he wanted to know if we'd be interested in putting together an activity book that could be used out on the trail with families. And so we started that process, the Education Committee started that process of figuring out how we were going to do a trail over 900 miles. To me, it was like a big national park. How are we going to do this trail into some booklets? And so we went back to the drawing board many, many times and eventually ended up having um, a booklet that went from um, kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, which we called the CAVI, um, to intermediate students called the freighter, um, Middle, stu middle school students, the Bullwhacker edition, and then high school through um, adults, the Scout. And so what we did, we divided the uh, trail into four portions. We did Eastern Terminus, Central Portion, the Mountain Routes, and then the Western Terminus. And so we wrote activities. We, we wrote this book for people traveling with families along the trail. 
at, it was just divided into segments because we just knew families would not have time to take this whole book and go clear down the trail. So it was divided up. You could take a two to three uh, car d um, travel in, your, in the area you lived or, or move out to another area and be able to complete the activities. And they are all of age appropriate level, which means that um, your little preschool granddaughter uh, would be able to do an activity along with uh, each um, grade level being able to handle what's in the booklet. Uh, they're all 100 pages long, and there are in the back of the book, there are places where you can pick up, I'll show you right here. Here's a list of the sites, and the way in the back of the book, and they're all along the Santa Fe Trail. Actually, if any of you like, want to pick up a book today, you can um, from here, and if, you, if we run out and you still want a book, uh, we'll just mail it to you. But anyway, you can pick up your books from these sites, and you can travel with your family, and you can fill in. Uh, we have also some side trips, so in case you would actually visit a national park, um, you could do their um, ranger program and get credit for this book. So it's eight out of uh, 10 activities. Some of them in this book do not require um, the children to get out on the trail if you've run to the end of the day and you're not doing any more trail tripping and, and they've got nine activities and they want one more. Um, there are some challenges in here that don't require for you to be on the trail. So they could finish that up. The neat thing about it is um, the, three, the three of us that put it together um, was Janet Armstead and she is now the director of this program because eventually this program had to be turned over to, from the National Park Service to the Santa Fe Trail Association. So she is now the director of this program. And so the students um, send um, the booklet to her and she sends them a certificate. And then they get these beautiful embroidery patches. And this is the uh, patch of the Eastern Terminus, um, followed by Central Portion, and the mountain routes, and of course the western terminus. So they can receive these patches. Um, every quarter she reports um, on the number of people that have joined into doing this Junior Wagon Master. It is also digital, so you could get on our site. And all these books are digital on our um, Santa Fe Trail website, so you could get on that site, you could download and print off you know, the areas that you wanted to, um, and do it that way if you don't have the book. So uh, once we took over this program, we had to find a way to print, and it, it was expensive. So we had a lot of donations because we we are constantly looking for money to print. We keep writing grants and don't seem to get them just yet, but... Uh, so we really found a great outlet um, recently, the Hutchison Correctional Facility. They have a, a printing company in the prison. And they, they print our books, um, 40 cents a book. <laughs> um, they get you for um, shipping. So if you um, have to have them shipped, we sh had it shipped once during COVID. Um, so that was like $300 to ship it. So um, the next time we, we printed off the books, we went ahead and had somebody living close to Hutchison to pick up the boxes, and then the boxes traveled um, to Janet uh, for uh, distribution. We have to go up and down the trail and all these sites, and we have to uh, keep stocking them, um, which is a great thing. It's a great problem. Um, you'll find um, in these books... Um, directions on where to go, uh, and then you have to fill in um, the activities. So uh, over the years, we've found mistakes, and we've, we've, we keep correcting little things. And um, so we hope this program can be sustainable for a long time and um, keep people traveling up and down the trail. Um, a class, we don't um, push for classrooms to, to give these out to teachers in classrooms, but you know, if a teacher would take a trip, an outside trip, not this year, but another time, 
with her students, she could you know, easily download some pages and, and have the kids at least do the activities. So that's what this junior um, Wagon Master program is all about. Um, I do have some brochures up here, um, some little stuff from the Santa Fe Trail Association. And um, so contributions to the, uh, these writings um, is Marsha Fox and Jen Armstead and myself. So we're the three that uh, put these together. And then last but not least, um, we're still taking Santa Fe Trail youth trips uh, with students. Uh, we started in 1985, took our first Santa Fe Trail trip. Um, we had the students in vans uh, traveling down the trail. It's a 10 to 11 day educational trip. Uh, we camp in national, uh, well, some, some parks we can, um, natural settings. Uh, we have tents and we cook our own food. And we followed the trail down to Santa Fe and back. So about 10, 10 to 11 days, uh, 11 and 12-year-olds take the trip. And they're been mostly from central Kansas area. Uh, we've moved from um, vans into charter buses because we were getting so many students interested in going on the trail that we had like 12 to 13 vans going down the road and wrong turns all the time. And we thought maybe it was kind of dangerous. So we've moved on to the buses and... We take the trip uh, on the odd years. Um, so this is the first time since 1985 that we're not taking the trip this year. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take the trip in uh, 2022 and open it up to a little bit older group of kids who would have missed this year. So um, it's a wonderful experience for children. You know, is it just central Kansas portion kids that get to go? No, sometimes we have um, people we know that want their grandchild to take this trip, and so they're allowed to do that. Um, like I said, we cook our own food. Um, the kids do the Junior Wagon Master program on the trip. And each time we pass through, the only part we don't get to is the eastern portion because we leave um, from the Wamigo area down and we start in Council Grove. So several of them have also finished all four patches because they'll, their family will leave and travel on the eastern portion. So if you just get into the Kansas City area and not further east, you still could complete the Easter portion of, the, of our booklet. So that's been very successful. So a lot of the kids come home. I've seen these patches on hats, and I've seen them on book bags. So it's just kind of fun that, you know, they thought it was worthwhile to keep it. So uh, without further ado, um, this is my uh, presentation, uh, just to give you an oversight of the Santa Fe Trail. And we got such wonderful speakers today that I'm, I'm looking forward to listening to all the events. So thank you very much. Chris, thank you so much for being a speaker today. You're welcome. You're right there. And then oh. we have the 2021 that's coming. So we'll, we'll, we'll email that to you. But, okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. What a great way to get started. Thank you so much, Chris, for giving that overview. It was very well researched, very complete. Thank you so much. So we'll take a break and uh, come back and uh, for Mike Bond's presentation. So go, go to...